Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm Dr. Norman Horn, and today we are honored to be joined by the legendary, the eminent, Scott Horton of Anti-War Radio. Now, Scott and I go way back, and we'll talk about that for a minute, but Scott, welcome to the show here. Happy to be here, Norm. How you doing, bud? Dude, I am so happy to have you on. I think this may be the first time we've had you on the LCI podcast, so this is terrific. But most people don't know that you and I have a pretty substantial history together that goes back even before LCC even existed. (laughs) Yeah, going back to the W. Bush years at least, right? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, back when I was in grad school at UT. And so when, I can't remember if you moved to Austin before I got there or got Oh, I've lived here my whole life since 76. Okay, see, that's kind of what I thought, but I wasn't 100% remembering correctly, I guess. But dude, when I remember when I kind of figured out that you were in the range of UT Austin, I was like, man, we got to get you to Libertarian Longhorns. <laughs> and we did, and we had such a great time. So we go, we go think, back a ways. Man. Am I right, Norm, that I did two different speeches for you guys? You did. And then, so one of them at least survived somewhere on YouTube. It probably does. I should download I that all, maybe have one of my guys stitch it together into one. It was back when YouTube had to be 10 minute segments and stuff, you know? Right. Like part <laughs> yeah. one through seven. Well, you know, the first one I think we did with you, it was just like we had our own little classroom or something that we normally met in and you came in. It was, we had a great little time with you. And then, and then we're like, we got to do something better than this. And then, so we did a big auditorium the next time and it was fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can find that now. Yeah, I, I know. I had a bunch of smart stuff. Well, no, you know what it was is I was telling y'all like the history of Iraq War II. So yeah. there probably wasn't that much like prescient stuff in there. Maybe a bit though. You never know. Yeah, but those were the days when, you know, it was, uh, gosh, it was just so much more, like, so much was more was fresh to us. So much more was, like, really, you know, it was even before the Ron Paul campaigns when we started working on that stuff. It was crazy. Yeah. But, you know, now we're, you know, a decade and a half later here, and both of us are doing very different things. But you're still doing... Yeah, I'm not doing very different things. (laughs) It's still exactly the same. (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I mean, you're still in the radio, but you've got the Libertarian Institute. You've got your books. I mean, you're just going gangbusters, man. And I'm so proud to have been able to know you through that. Yeah, well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'm trying hard. So Yeah. Well, and so tell us a little bit about your project, you know, that is the Libertarian Institute for a sec here. Yeah, which, by the way, I put in my name in Libertarian Longhorns and I'm not finding it. So if you can oh. find that video, if anybody has it, send it to scott at scotthorton.org because I want to hey, see that. There you go. How right I was about things. <laughs> well, so the Institute is just, you know, I really created it honestly in the first place because I wanted to give William Norman Grigg a job. And I thought, well, how am I going to give him a job? I don't really have a job. I mean, I work for antiwar.com, but just barely. And I realized that, you know, what we'll just do is we'll just join forces and call ourselves an institute and raise money for our institute and pay our sellers that way. And then we'll employ ourselves. And then, you know, who'd be perfect? Sheldon Richmond to be our third partner since at that time he had just recently left the Future Freedom Foundation. So that was how it started, was the three of us. And then, of course, Will Grigg tragically died about six months later. Yeah. We've been trying to trudge and carry on since then. We got a great group of writers and podcasters there. And, you know, I'm really proud of the effort. And, you know, probably the most important thing we do is publish books, a few of my own, but also two of Sheldon's, one of Will Griggs, and we just put out one by Keith Knight, which is all about libertarian anarchism, which is really great. It's called The Voluntarist uh, Manifesto, right? No, The Voluntarist Handbook. Uh Aha. It's already here on my shelf. You'd think I get it right. (laughs) And then, yeah, we got a, a bunch of great podcasters. And a ton of great writers, you know, including the legendary Jim Bovard and others. And so, yeah, it's a lot to brag about. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, dude. It's, I'm trying to set the standard for this is what libertarians care about. Yep. And man, it's just, it's so cool to see you guys going and to be, you know, kind of working alongside you guys as well, you know, just trying to reach out to various people and, and at least in, you know, in your space and in our space. 
you know, it's good to be part of that mission together. And so I really appreciate, you know, all that you've done for Liberty over the years. And, and I'm glad that you're here today to talk even more about something that, of course, you're very, very passionate about, very knowledgeable about, and that's what's going on in the Middle East. So I kind of want to start there. There's been a lot of stuff going down in Israel and Palestine recently. So in particular, the ceasefire and the new discussions that are, that are happening, what is it that those of us who are perhaps a little less knowledgeable about the history and whatnot should know about what's happening right now in the Israel-Palestine area? Yeah. Well, I have to admit to you that I have not been, you know, up to my eyeballs in the nuts and bolts of this latest conflict. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that the Israelis launched strikes against Islamic Jihad, which is essentially yep. a break off of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, but that they did not bomb Hamas and Hamas stayed out of it. And Hamas is really the ruling faction in the Gaza Strip with Egyptian and, you know, Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Islamic Jihad as sort of a minor player. And I do know that, what, 12 civilians were killed or 24 civilians were killed or something like that, including some children. I saw a picture earlier today of a young girl with her arms and or one arm and both legs blown off Oof. in her hospital bed there. And, you know, I think what people need to understand about this situation is, you know, it's confusing and it's deliberately portrayed in a confusing manner. So on one hand, the Palestinians are the country next door and they keep attacking Israel and using terrorism to try to extort land away from Israel. And can you believe the liberals want Israel to trade land for peace? In other words, negotiate with terrorists and give in to their demands and give up Israeli land to these right. terrorists and only then will they get peace, something like that. But that's just completely wrong. I mean, the fact of the matter is, when Israel was created in the first place in 1947 and 48, they cleansed the land of about 750,000 Palestinians. And they did keep a couple of hundred thousand too, but they created essentially an 80-20 super duper Jewish majority. That way they could have a Jewish democracy. And then those Palestinian citizens of Israel are sort of second class citizens, but they are citizens, have some representation. But then in 1967, there was a war. In fact, in 48, they made a secret deal with the King of Jordan that he would take all of the West Bank so that the Palestinians could not have their own state while the Israelis were establishing theirs. That's in the first place. Then in 67, there's a war which Israel starts, despite all the propaganda, attacked Egypt and then Syria and eventually Jordan jumped in. And Israel, with American help, beat all three of them and took the West Bank from Jordan and the Gaza Strip from Egypt. And not that it was Egyptian territory, but it was under their control, it's Palestinian land. So in other words, all of historic Palestine is under the control of Israel and has been since 1967, nine years before I was born, and I'm old. <laughs> so it's not the case as you often hear somebody like Ben Shapiro say, that what would you do if the Mexicans were firing rockets over the border? But that analogy is inapt. The correct analogy would be, what would you do if the Navajo were firing rockets over the wall of their reservation in Arizona? And if you put it that way, aren't I being fair when I say your first instinct is we would negotiate? Yeah. Right? We're not just going to go in there and bomb them. And so the Palestinians are not the country next door. That's why, and this is what I mean about the deliberately kind of confusing thing, is on one hand, they portray it like they're already the country next door. On the other hand, someday, one day, there will be a two-state solution. And that's the reason why the Israelis don't have to treat the Palestinians fairly and give them citizenship and give them equal rights and treat them with basic human respect. Because someday, just you wait, the Palestinians will have independence. And then they'll be free in their own little independent Palestinian state. But of course, that never happens. It'd be like if Arizona promised that one day the Navajo are going to have their own independent state. Yeah, only sort of. They're going to have some sovereignty, but absolutely under the control of the Bureau of Indian Affairs run out of Washington, D.C., right? And yeah. so, in other words, the Palestinians 
have been beaten for going on half a century now already. They are occupied, already conquered people. So why aren't there a bunch of Israeli Jews in the Gaza Strip where they've been bombing? Well, that's because in 2005, the Ariel Sharon government pulled the Israeli Jewish settlers out of the Gaza Strip just so they could put it under siege. And just so they could freeze, as they put it, in formaldehyde. People can Google that up. That's Ariel Sharon's own ministers talking. So they can freeze the peace process and make it impossible by essentially dividing and conquering. I mean, they're already geographically divided, Gaza and the West Bank, but now politically dividing them by pulling the settlers out. And they called it ending the occupation, but they didn't end the control of the territory whatsoever. It'd be like if you had an all-black county in northern Missouri, and they just put it under siege and said, yeah, but there's no white settlers in this county. And so they're free and they have self-rule. They don't have self-rule. They're essentially in prison, right? They're surrounded by an enemy that has them completely under siege. So in that context, Hamas is not the government of the Gaza Strip. Hamas are trustees in an Israeli open-air prison. And the reason, the excuse for the siege is that Hamas rules the Gaza Strip. But the only reason Hamas rules the Gaza Strip is because the Israelis pulled their forces out and insisted on holding an election that Hamas won. But then they actually only barely won it and they had to form a coalition. But America and Israel and Egypt ganged up to try to do a coup d'etat and help the Fatah faction overthrow Hamas. But they lost and Hamas ended up consolidating control over the Gaza Strip. But that was back in 2006 and 2007. And even then, the majority of the population of Gaza were minors. So not even really minors. The majority were under 18 and so had no voice and no say in the election whatsoever. Well, if the majority of them had no say in the election back in 2007, what does that say about the population of the Gaza Strip now? that some very small minority of the people in Gaza now even had any say whatsoever in Hamas taking power back 15 years ago. And yet they've lived under siege all along, ever since then. And that's why you hear about from time to time stunts like people taking boats and trying to wage a humanitarian flotilla to break into Gaza to bring them humanitarian relief. And of course, the IDF seizes their civilian boats on the high seas in order to enforce the blockade. So that's the reality. The Palestinians are not the country next door. They're not the terrorists attacking Israel. They are the people who have already been conquered. They are the ones defending themselves from aggression. And that's the law, and it's just the simple fact of the matter. And it's just so awkward to like kind of try to parse out everything that's going on over there for us. Because of, you know, even though like Ben Shapiro has some good things to say, but he's so bad on this particular point, it's really awkward. And then we have all the Zionists around. I mean, it's baffling to me, dude, even having a, been in a church recently that literally took weeks to explain the importance of prophecies around the modern nation of Israel. And that's just not the way that we at the Libertarian Christian Institute or, or my denomination or how I've ever dealt with any of that, biblically speaking. And it's just to hear that stuff to be used as this justification for what's going on over there is just beyond the pale to me. And I don't understand even like, you would think that those conservatives who at least had some semblance of knowledge about, say, George Washington and the fact that we shouldn't be in, entangling alliances, that at the very least, you might agree with, you know, Tom Woods saying things like that foreign aid is a bad idea. And, you know, Tom is faint, is kind of, uh, well, maybe this is a this is an old quote of his, but he said, I would only support foreign aid if I hated the human race because it ends up just destroying nations. And this is one of those, this is one of those facets. And it's baffling to me that people seem to be so blind to this sort of the realities of what's going on over there. Even if you would say that the violence needs to stop from the Palestinian side, okay, fine. Like, okay, sure. Yeah, let's stop that. But not at the cost of, well, let's arm Israel to the teeth with, our, with money that comes from taxes over here. 
what is so confusing to people about this? I mean, why do people keep making these mistakes over and over again, Scott? Well, I mean, part of it is, I mean, think about where this discussion started. We're talking about Israel was bombing who? Yeah, some kids too, but they're bombing Egyptian Islamic, or sorry, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Yeah. The Egyptian Islamic Jihad ended up becoming Al-Qaeda. I mean, merged with the Saudi group and became Al-Qaeda. Mm-hmm. And if you see them or you see Hamas marching in the street and they got their, you know, green bandanas over their face and their, you know, whatever, they look all militaristic. And of course, they speak a very different language, have much browner skin. And you hear, you know, Israel is in your Christmas songs and stuff like that. <laughs> but the Muslims aren't, right? The, Islam comes after Christianity. So yeah. American Christians, or I guess Christians in general, sort of feel an affinity with Judaism in a way that they don't with Islam, even though Muslims call Christians people of the book, a lot of, especially American Christians, they have no idea that Allah is just another word for the very same God that they worship. You know what I mean? They don't know that. To them, Islam is as alien as Hinduism or something like that, where there's just no overlap and that kind of thing. But no, these are not just monotheists, but the very same God that American Christians and Jews worship too, just by different names. So. There's just a profound ignorance there. And then on the other side of the story is, first of all, the ruling caste of Israeli Jews, not the majority, but the ruling caste of Israeli Jews are Ashkenazi Jews, meaning white Europeans. And so Mm -hmm. they look a lot like us. And a lot of them, like Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, the King Bibi, the very longtime prime minister of Israel, speaks absolutely perfect English. So do many of his, you know, of the top politicians in Israel. And they work very hard at their public relations in this country and all that too, to instill Americans with the feeling that Israel is sort of like Fort Apache out there on the yeah. front line. It's the American of, protectorate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, it's the our closest uh, ally. leading edge of the clash of civilizations leading mm-hmm. our front. When of course, if you just look at that critically, I mean, what are you really saying? What you're really saying is Israel keeps picking fights and getting us into them. Yeah. You know, but that's not very polite, but that's the reality of it. It was the Israelis who insisted that we attack Iraq. It's the Israelis who continued to insist on Obama's dirty war in Syria and who have been pushing for war with Iran for 20 years now and luckily haven't been able to get it because the Pentagon keeps overruling them because it would be such a chore to try to do. It would be you know, four or five times the size of Iraq War II, maybe worse. But it's the Israelis behind that. I mean... You look at the history of the war on terrorism, where you have Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan and George Bush and Bill Clinton's mercenaries, these Bin Ladenite terrorists, which Bill Clinton did continue to support them all through the 1990s in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Chechnya, he did. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who organized the September 11th attack, he earned his stripes in Bosnia, fighting on Bill Clinton's side. And then they turned on us, knocked our towers down, hit our Pentagon, so we turned on them. And actually, Bush let bin Laden go at Tora Bora, and I prove in both books, I think I demonstrate quite clearly in both books, that he deliberately let them escape at Tora Bora and instead took the fight to the Taliban, happy to try to confuse your mom and dad about whether the Taliban was Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda was the Taliban, when, of course, they're entirely different organizations and groups of people. Mm -hmm. And it was one that attacked us and not the other, right? And then, of course, they went to Iraq, where, and people ought to know this by now, people have heard this by now, they know it's true, but Picture it in your brain real quick here, where you have Persia and and you have Iraq and where you have, you know, the uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula and all that there. George W. Bush gave Baghdad to Iran's friends, the Shiites. That's what that whole five-year mess was about. Million people killed in a giant civil war. America put the Shiites in power. Well, then they told us, thanks for helping us win. Now beat it. Because they didn't like us and they didn't need us because they're friends with our enemies, the Iranians, or at least our regional adversaries, the Iranians. So in other words, George Bush really screwed up. That was not supposed to be the result of the war. But the important point, Norm, is not to make fun of the man. It's that they've been trying to make up for that error ever since, that they Mm -hmm. empowered the Iranian Shiites and their friends. Well, how do you make up for that? The answer is, beginning with Bush, not with Obama, you switch back to Al-Qaeda's side. And he started back in Al-Qaeda 
you know, Bin Ladenite, suicide bomber, head chopper type terrorists, just like Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Our guys were fighting at the time in Iraq War II. He started backing them in Lebanon, in Syria, where Liz Cheney was in charge of supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and trying to forge them into a government in exile to replace Assad. And a group called Jandala in Iran, really dangerous Bin Ladenite terrorists in Iran. And then Obama picked up right where W. Bush left off. And he was back in Al-Qaeda in the war in Libya. And he was back in Al-Qaeda in the war in Syria, which, as you remember, blew up into the Islamic fascist caliphate thing that they had to launch Iraq War III to destroy in 2014 through 17, after they had conquered all of Western Iraq. And they're fighting on Al-Qaeda's side in the war in Yemen as well. Why? Because they're fighting against the Shiites, the Houthis, who are friends with Iran. And why does America care? It's because of Israel and Saudi Arabia. But it's not the American people who hate the Ayatollah more. If you ask the American people, do you hate Al-Qaeda that knocked the towers down or Hezbollah that did not, which they're the Shiites in Lebanon allied with Iran, the American people's enemy is Bin Laden and them, right? Of course, again, our government made that enemy for us, but still they did. But Iran didn't do anything to us. So how come we're on Al-Qaeda's side against the Shiites in the region? And the answer is because that's what Israel and Saudi Arabia want, especially after Bush gave Baghdad to Tehran. And isn't it just like super crazy to consider that you kind of hinted at this, but the idea that we keep kind of going, and I say we loosely here, I am trying to purge myself of using those types of possessives and (laughs) <laughs> at times about describing our foreign policy. It's not your fault, Norm. English is a very commie language in that <laughs> way. It really is. <laughs> we okay, and an our one, okay. and us and all the time we talk about Oh, but, but like the U.S. Do. government, you know, continued to just switch sides. I mean, there's the classic picture of, of you know, uh, Donald Rumsfeld handshaking with Saddam Hussein way right. back in the day. Mm-hmm. And of course, we were friends before we were enemies, before we were enemies, before we were friends. And then it, I mean, it, it just goes crazy, right? Yeah, yeah so when I wrote Enough Already, I yeah. gave it to my mom. I didn't have a real good editor lined up. My uh, last editor couldn't do it. So I just sent it to a few different friends for like copy editing purposes. You know, just check my grammar if you <laughs> notice any screwy sentences, this kind of thing. And uh, so one of my friends was my mom. I gave it to her. She's smart. So she went over it. And I asked her, so how do you like it? And she just busted out laughing and said, I was trying to keep track. And I lost track of how many times we switched sides at 10. I couldn't remember. When I got to 12 or 13, I couldn't remember if it was 12 or 13. And that's just from starting at Jimmy Carter, you know, and just switching sides back and forth, back and forth. I mean, we switched sides two or three times before Reagan's even inaugurated, you know? And if this is not the definition of like entangled alliances that Washington warned the United States of back in 17, you know, the late 18th century, right? You know, what is? Why does it take 200 years to figure this out? You know what? Come on. They sold this myth and you could see why our parents and their parents' generation really bought this or even, you know, their parents too. That after World War II, of course, you know, America rules the world, two-thirds of it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the commies got the other third, I guess. But no one would argue that Stalin and Mao ought to be in charge of the world order. And the Brits are bankrupt now. The French and the Germans are in no position to rule the world. America was this massive industrial machine that did not get burned to the ground in the war like the rest of the industrial powers did in the East and the West. Mm -hmm. And so just at the end of the war, in purely monetary or, you know, in financial terms and in military terms, America just had absolute global dominance and including over the commies, you know, with far more military power than the Soviet Union had. And so then the idea was, well, look, we just finished beating Hitler and Hirohito, right? The definition of evil, if anybody knows anything about how Japan prosecuted their war in the East, and of course, everybody knows about the way the Nazis fought their war in Europe. We defeated the ultimate bad guys and feeling pretty good about ourselves, rationalized that, well, you know, that George was Washington is out of date, yeah. right? If somebody has to rule the world and it better be us or else it'll be somebody else. And particularly, it'll be the Reds. And so we can't have that. 
the way you kind of phrase that right there it reminds me of your debate even with Bill Crystal mm-hmm. a little bit. And I think just you know sidebar for a second, we we'll, we'll get right back to this. But like, if our listeners haven't seen your debate with Bill Crystal at the Soho Forum, you need to do it uh, <laughs> because it was, was amazing. <laughs> That was like, anyway, but yeah, so sidebar like, over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fair enough. But look, I mean, the problem is this, right? Is first of all, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And if right. America just completely renounced our empire and came home, there is no one set to replace us. And yeah. I'm sorry because I know that people are inundated with this stuff all day about China, China, China. But you know what? 20 years ago, they had you saying Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. But it yeah. just wasn't true. It's just a narrative. And they're doing the same thing with Ukraine right now. And because it's Biden and the Democrats doing it, there's a little bit of room for conservatives to be skeptical about these narratives. The Soviet Union is dead and gone 30 years. This is red, white, and blue Republican Russia. Yes, it's corrupt, conservative Russia. It ain't, you know, pure freedom and libertarianism and the (laughs) rule of law. But it is not communism. It is not totalitarianism. It's, you know, essentially, you know, a larger version of Hungary, right? It's a center-right, well, eh, yeah, a little, maybe one click to the right of center-right democracy. They have regular elections. I mean, Putin is obviously a strong man and sort of a president for life, but so was Franklin Roosevelt. And so would every other president would be if he could be in this country. But they have regular elections for all of their state and local positions and, and their parliament and all of that stuff, their Duma and all that. So it's far from perfect, but look who's talking. Yeah. about flawed republics, you know? And why is ours so screwed up that it's even comparable to that kind of corruption like you would see in Russia? It's because of the world empire. It's because of this doctrine that if it ain't America, then it'll be somebody worse, so we have to do it. But then what happens? We become somebody worse because that's what the job is. The job is being the British empire that everybody hated, including us. It's totally a race to the bottom. And that kind of does bring us, you know, full circle back to, you know, the other kind of major topic of the day, which is Ukraine and Russia and what's going on there. I mean, say what you will about, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, Russia is the aggressor here. They are in the wrong. We know this. But it's unbelievable that yet again, we're continuing to see the war drums, you know, getting beaten on. So where do you feel it? we're kind of at at this point? You know, is it, is it as stalemate as it kind of looks at this point? Or what are the risks involved right now that we should be kind of aware of? Well, I don't think it's a stalemate. I think the advantage belongs to the Russians. You know, I said to Colonel McGregor, geez, it seems like they could have taken pretty much the whole Donbass, almost all of it from the very beginning. And it seems like they're not taking all that much territory, you know? And he said, well, yeah, but they're not fighting for territory. They're just fighting against the Ukrainian military, grinding it to bits until it's destroyed. And yeah. time is on the Russian side. Artillery shells are on the Russian side. They have more men. They have more, literally, more firepower, more ability to rain down, you know, essentially carpet bombing with artillery tubes and just, you know, moving slowly and grinding the Ukrainian military to bits. And frankly, they've been, from what I've read, pretty successful at countering a lot of the American and Turkish drones and other technology that the West was fielding in to help the Ukrainians, the Russians have come up with their countermeasures against that and really kind of nullifying those advantages to some degree anyway. But so, I mean, it's a terrible story. And I agree with you totally that the Russians are in the wrong here, that this was an illegal and aggressive war and an immoral war. And they must have had other alternatives than to do this. And I can think of a couple. They could have just played hardball with the natural gas right off the bat and cut off all of Europe and said, you know, we want a new negotiation with get the Americans out and get the British and the French and the Germans in here to talk as middlemen and see if you guys want to freeze in the dark. Back then, it was still cold last winter too. You know, they could have played real hardball with that. They could have asked for peacekeepers from a third nation with no dog in the fight like India or somebody like that to come in and stand on the border of the Donbass and guarantee the supposed ceasefire that the Kiev government was refusing to live up to. And that could have enforced a real ceasefire there. They could have threatened to, you know, veto everything in the UN Security Council until, you know, the Americans promised not to bring Ukraine into NATO or whatever, you know, few demands. If you look at their demands, 
from their proposed treaty of last December. It was all essentially reasonable. It was absolutely a reasonable basis to begin negotiations. You don't have to necessarily give them every single thing they want. I understand that, but yeah, well, that's what they were asking right? for was not the moon. <laughs> what they were asking for was a, you know, a decent respect, and that was it. So, the war could have been avoided in the first place. And the fact, you know, let me ask you something here because to me this is just the most obvious thing in the world. But then again, you know, obviously I got a chip on my shoulder about this and have forever. <laughs> but did it not just seem obviously huge and scandalous to you the fact that they were not really negotiating? First of all, they were like threatening the Russians, you better not do it. But they weren't really talking to him or when they were talking to him, they certainly weren't willing to concede anything important. And they made that clear. And then after the war, sorry, I guess this is the point I'm really getting at, is as soon as the war started, didn't you expect all the narrative to be, well, we got to negotiate immediately. We have to send our diplomats to Geneva. We have to talk to these people. We have to bring an end to the fighting. You can't let a war continue right on Russia's border for more than a day or a week. We have to bring this thing to an immediate end. And then to me, it was just shocking the way nobody talked like that. Nobody was saying, oh my God, we've got to get a ceasefire at all costs and we'll figure out the rest later. But end the violence immediately because we're risking thermonuclear war and we can't do that and it just seems like nobody's saying that. But it also seems to me like that's the most obvious thing in the world. Yeah, dude, that was perplexing to me in many respects because the moment, I mean, we all knew if you were, you know, for those who were paying at least nominal attention to that, because, and, and to wit, I'm sure, you know, it's not like everybody was doing so, but everybody knew that was paying attention that there were attempts to negotiate by Russia. And the fact that it didn't proceed very well and then precipitated into the hot war. But then we didn't go like, well, okay, now it's time to negotiate. But instead went straight to things like sanctions. That was baffling to me. Because anybody with half a brain in economics will know what that result of that's going to be. I mean, everybody knows exactly what happened there. And then yep. they tried to pull all these different little strings like, oh, we're, we're just going to put sanctions on the, we're going to, you know, seize property from the oligarchs. And like, that's going to do anything. I mean, where do you get this stuff? Why not go to the source? You know, if you want to, if you want to actually get something stopped, you immediately go to the negotiation table. And the fact that they didn't was definitely perplexing. It just baffles me to no end even today. Yeah. I mean, I think they've decided that they're kicking Russia out of Europe. They want them to turn east. They don't want them to forge a tighter relationship with Germany and open up a new peace pipeline. They'd rather have a Cold War than a peace you don't want them to relate with Europe. So what are they going to do? They're going to go to China. They're going to go to India. They're going to go to other nations that, I mean, yeah. <laughs> if you're not you're going to encircle them and completely blockade them and cut off all trade, which would be a mistake anyway, what are they going to do? They're going to find alternatives. I mean, to me, this is silver linings, but of course, at the risk of nuclear war. But as I was complaining before, I don't like this whole post-World War II order where America supposedly guarantees the peace. Yeah. Because, and this was the crux of my debate with Crystal, mm -hmm. which everyone seemed to agree that I won handily, which was, you can only claim we keep the peace by ignoring all of the violence. Yeah. And especially in the case of Bill Crystal, all the violence that he himself proposed, you know, unendingly his entire career. That you could say we kept the peace, but yes, we kept the peace in Europe, kinda, if you don't count the war in Ukraine and you don't count <laughs> yeah. the war in Yugoslavia, and if you don't count us bringing the Germans with us to Afghanistan and, you know, many of the All other... All of the uh, other interventions in the Middle yeah. East from 1947 onward. <laughs> yeah. And that's just in Europe. But then if you look at the rest of the world, well, we killed 2 million Koreans, 3 million Vietnamese, and another 2 million Laotians and Cambodians. Oh, 5 yeah. million people. And then, you know, I was just watching a thing today about how Nixon and Kissinger helped engineer the Pakistani civil war and attempted Holocaust that killed 300,000 something people in Bangladesh, or it was more than that, in Bangladesh in the early 1970s, 1971. And you know, all kinds of things like that, right? Supporting Suharto over Sukarno and then the right wing bloodbath against all the dissidents in East Timor and all the leftists and anyone else who opposed them in Indonesia. And there are a million like that. You know, they did a coup in Guatemala in 1954 that led to a civil war that killed half a million people. 
They invaded Iraq. They killed a million people. They started a war in Libya that killed at least a few tens of thousands. In Syria, at least half a million were killed. In Syria and Iraq War Three, at least half a million, maybe more. In Yemen, at least half a million. And you just call that peace, I guess, because they can't really fight back against us other than hijacking our planes and ramming them into our buildings every once in a while. But for the Hawks, they just, you know, when they say peace, they just mean, well, Germany and Russia haven't fought because America is the dominant military power in Germany. And we convinced the Germans to accept that. So now they don't have an independent foreign policy. We have Germany's foreign policy in our file, and we will keep them from picking a fight with everybody else. But again, the problem is, first of all, we can't afford this. But second of all, they extend that policy not just to keeping Germany from picking fights with anybody, but keeping anyone from picking fights with anyone, right? Like essentially the doctrine that the federal government shall keep the several states from fighting amongst each other here in the United States of America, in the states in the Union, that that same principle applies to the whole world. And so we should have a military alliance essentially with everybody and spread our so-called security umbrella by promising to have everybody's back. But then there's got to be an enemy somewhere or else, for example, why does Germany need us? And so, you know, right as they were about to open this peace pipeline, was when the Americans stepped up all of their, you know, promising to bring Ukraine into NATO and pouring more arms in and all of these things and refusing to negotiate with the Russians in good faith. And then, of course, the moment that Russia invaded Ukraine, the pipeline was canceled. And the Germans' reason for having us there was maintained. So, Scott, this is so much great information here. And I'm I'm going to probably end up having to listen to this whole podcast again a couple of times to try and reabsorb and, and get into all this even more. Hey, not fun. Yeah. But I kind of want to, as we begin to draw to a close, kind of let's drill down into a couple of different things. I know so many of our listeners, you know, we get questions at times and about like, well, what do I say to people when they try to throw this, that, and the other at me? So here's kind of where I'm going to, I'm going to go as we draw to a close. We'll start with Ukraine and we'll get back to Israel for a sec. And the question is kind of like this. Well, what should I do? What should we do? Scott, like, what's the answer here? Now, we've kind of hinted at it. But let's summarize, like, what's the quick answer that somebody should be able to, to bring out and bring to bear I mean, when the hawks are accosting us about, like, well, we got to get out there. We got to help Ukraine. Right. We got to do all this more here. What would you say is, you know, kind of the one-minute answer to that effect? The greatest American ever, Ron Paul, said it. Just come home. That's it. And listen, there's just no reason to believe, Norm, that America's holding the world together. And that if we came home, it would all break out into chaos and terror. Now, maybe there'd be some border disputes. And you know what? If we weren't so conflicted in our interests, maybe we could help negotiate some of those. But look at, for example, when they even hint about pulling out of the Middle East at all, peace starts breaking out. So right now, America, since Obama... America has told Saudi and UAE, go ahead and kill every last Yemeni. We'll help you do it. And we'll pay for it all. We'll you know, sell you planes and give you all the intelligence and logistics. And we'll help enforce your blockade and all these things. Well, in the fall of 2019, the House and the Senate passed the War Powers Resolution. Now, Trump ended up vetoing it. But I think even before he vetoed, or no, 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 after he vetoed it, the UAE immediately sent an emissary straight to Tehran. I don't know if it was the ambassador. I think it was the ambassador straight to Tehran to start talking with the Iranians. Again, that's why we're helping them kill the Yemenis is because it's a Shiite regime friendly to Iran that's in power in Sana. And then when Biden came into power, he lied, but he said after just two weeks in power that he was calling off American support for the Saudis and the UAE in their war against the Yemenis. And the Saudis then immediately sent their ambassador to Baghdad to meet with the Iranians. And so in other words, you know, the kind of cliche or whatever, the the received wisdom and consensus is supposed to be that if we weren't there standing between everyone, they would all fight. When in fact, we're incentivizing them to fight. We're creating what the economists call a moral hazard. And you promise a bank a bailout. I'm not sure why they call it a moral hazard who coined that term. But it (laughs) means when you promise a bank a bailout, they will make riskier loans. 
because they know you've got their back. It's just like a bratty little kid with a big, tough older brother who always comes to his aid. He'll go and get into more fights because he knows his brother is going to come and have his back. And so when America backs off, immediately people start negotiating. Now, does that mean everything's paradise? No. But does it make sense for Iran and Saudi to fight a war against each other? No. They don't have any actual territory in dispute. It would cost them both a trillion dollars. Why in the hell would they do that? They would only do it if America does it for them. In fact, Robert Gates, who was Bush and then Obama's Secretary of Defense, complained about this. That the Saudis said, listen, it's time for you to invade Iran. Hurry up. Get to it. Chop, chop. (laughs) And Gates was like, wait a minute. What are we, mercenaries? Kind of. You know? And Americans are used to being racist against brown people, but it's a little (laughs) bit different when it's Saudi royalty saying, you know, treating the white wasps like they're the help. Right? Hey, you and them, go fight. Like we're their servants. And all of a sudden, Gates is offended. Amazing. So it kind of like bleeds into this a similar sort of answer with the next question, which I kind of have, which is very much like, what do you, what do you do? Like, how do we talk about Israel? And I mean, my answer to the question of like, well, well, what would you do about Israel? It's like, well, it's similar to just go home. It's just stop the flow of money. Sure. And, and stop all the diplomatic support too. Yeah. I mean, what they're doing is totally illegal under all international law and they yeah. know it. They only get away with it because America gives them a blank check of yeah. military power and money and diplomatic support on the UN Security Council and the rest. So, so if we stop the entangling alliances, so much of it just solves itself. That's right. And yeah, there's going to be other problems, like you said, but like it's not our responsibility to solve it all. Yeah. <laughs> Look, the solution is for Palestine is simple. It's either the Palestinians get independence, and that means the Israelis are going to have to pull about a million settlers out of the West Bank, which yeah. is probably, you know, right now, way past too late and impossible. But either the Palestinians get an independent state on the West Bank and Gaza Strip, yeah. and including the eastern half of the city of Jerusalem, or they get Israeli citizenship. And it becomes one state with equal rights for everybody, and it's no longer a Jewish democracy. It's just a democracy. Yeah. Because otherwise, what we have is... 1940s Mississippi, yeah, right? Complete exactly. apartheid. And, and that's a great way of tolerable. describing it, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, you know, even I saw Ali Abu Nima, who's very much a one-state guy, he's a Palestinian expat, or, uh, refugee, I should say, and I saw where someone was saying, well, we support the two-state solution, which as I was saying, it's always an illusion anyway. There's the t- mm-hmm. It's already too late, and the Israelis never meant to negotiate that in good faith anyway. It was just a stalling tactic while they colonized more of the West Bank. But somebody said on Twitter, I forgot, some politician was saying, well, I'm a supporter of the two-state solution. And he responded to that, segregation now, segregation forever, right? And so, (laughs) like, I do make the analogy to Jim Crow from time to time. But I guess that particular analogy you know, was very powerful. Is what he was saying was, even if you gave them the two-state solution, what's that really saying? Take the analogy all the way back to the American South. And what if in Mississippi, they were saying, oh, it's going to be a two-state solution, a two-state solution. We're going to have, what, North Mississippi that's (laughs) predominantly black. We're going to give them some kind of pseudo self-rule, which means they get none of the benefits of being part of the state of Mississippi. None of the protection, but all of the persecution and all of the hardship that comes from having to carry the burden of a state, right? But without their own security force, still completely under the control of the whites and whatever, right, in the capital city. And so that would be unacceptable. That's not a good enough solution to apartheid. Yeah. And the fact is the people over there need equal rights. And if it wasn't for the Americans having their back, the Israelis would have to figure it out. You're either going to give these people real independence or you're going to give them equal rights. And after all, it's their country. People act like the Palestinians are the invaders. When we're talking about a two-state solution, we're talking about them settling for a measly stinking 22% of what's left of historic Palestine. And not even 22% anymore, far less than that. And, you know, something a lot of people don't know is that Yasser Arafat recognized Israel within 67 borders. In other words, was willing to concede Israeli sovereignty over all of 
what they still call Israel proper, not the occupied territories, in 1988. In 88. And they just don't talk about that. And Hamas, of course, has promised repeatedly that they would, in a final status negotiation, recognize Israel within 67 borders. They're not willing to declare that yet because they want their state too, and they don't want to give up too much first. But they have repeatedly indicated, as I said over and over again, I've seen them on the Charlie Rose show and whatever, saying yeah. that they're willing to negotiate. So again, just like the bratty kid with the tough big brother, if America's not there to back Israel up, then the answer is what's going to happen? They'll have to do the right thing. So it's amazing. It's like the enabling power is just what's holding civilization back on some <laughs> in some level because these are solvable problems. Seriously. And look, this panic over China, let's talk about Taiwan real quick to wrap up here. Oh, yeah. You mentioned the panic is China's replacing us as the world power. As I said, right? If we don't do it, somebody else will. But that's mm -hmm. just not true. China's entire Navy is invented to keep us away. And it's not even necessarily created for invading and conquering Taiwan. It's invented for keeping us out, if they ever do, more than anything. But that's even what the Americans call it. Anti-access, area denial. That's the American term for the Chinese doctrine. I mean, what does that yeah. sound like? Hmm. It's purely defensive. Anti-access means the North Americans won't be the dominant power in the South China Sea. And area denial means when they come, we'll be able to keep them at bay, right? I and mean, that's all they're talking about. It's kind of a redundant term anyway, isn't it? It, um, it does sound like it, yeah. Yeah, so I saw a thing today. I just, I want to just quit. <laughs> it was a poll they did. And yeah, I don't know exactly how accurate this is. If anything, it's probably worse than this, honestly. But they asked people to find and locate, you know, to, you know, with a marker, indicate where is Taiwan on a map of East Asia and the Pacific? And, you know, there were some number of people who got it right. I think they said it was 34%, which I actually no. thought was probably high. But then you see the marks all over China, all over Indonesia, all over Japan and Korea, Australia. People look at a map of the world and they think Australia is Taiwan. Well, that's and they go, oh, well, we can't <laughs> let China take that over. Or they mark China itself. And they go, oh, maybe that's Taiwan. So they're supposed to be all upset that China is going to invade Taiwan. But they don't know what a Taiwan is. They don't know the first effing thing about it. Well, let's start with this. Taiwan is part of China. <laughs> yeah. So it would be like if Florida seceded from the Union and the Union decided to conquer them. I would be opposed to that. But <laughs> it would be like if all the nations of Europe then said, USA, you better not solve your problem with Florida violently or we will jump in and defend Florida from you. I think it even would be pretty, pretty offended by like, that. Girl, yeah, <laughs> we would rather be dominated by DC than protected by the likes of you, right? So that's what we're talking about. Again, with everybody's crappy analogies and misunderstandings. Taiwan is not Australia. Taiwan is a tiny little island that is worth nothing to the United States of America. Nothing. People go, oh, they make microchips there. Yeah, they make microchips in Austin, Texas too, dude. Yeah. You know, if China invaded and conquered Taiwan, it would make zero difference to the lives of any American whatsoever other than people in California with relations in Taiwan, right? Like personal connections. But in terms of what difference does it make to America? The answer is nothing. And you know what? That's why 50 years ago, Richard Nixon shook hands with Mao Zedong and told him, I don't give a damn about Taiwan. And he told Taiwan, sorry, I'm kicking you out of the UN Security Council and I'm giving your seat to Beijing, which obviously America should have done 30 years before anyway. <laughs> and his pro and con list, you know, his list of what matters to us and what matters to them, he put Taiwan in the list of things that does not really matter to the United States of America. And what did matter at that time especially, and you could argue again if you were any of these kooks, anyway, you think they might, 
argue that we want to keep China separate from Russia. And if we can win China over to us, that means we're winning them away from the Soviet Union and turning them into our allies in the Cold War against their former allied communist state. And of course, what happened once we did that was that the right wing of the Communist Party took over and adopted capitalism. And they went from starving to death, and most right-wingers know this, but not everyone knows this. They went from starving to death by the tens of millions. And that's true. That's really true. The communists, in their attempts to create their, you know, centrally planned economic workers' paradise there, they reduced the entire country to just like caveman status. They destroyed everything in their Great Leap Forward and their cultural revolution and and all of their absolutely harebrained economic policies. They make the New Deal look like Ludwig von Mises, okay? (laughs) And people were reduced to literally they're eating each other, okay? That was what happened in China under communism. And then what happened was America made friends with them and then, and forsook Taiwan. I'll get back to Taiwan in just a sec. But, and then the right wing of the Communist Party took over China and invented capitalism over there, and they stopped starving to death. And they went from the poorest nation in the world. Remember, or you might be too young to remember this. I remember this. You better eat every last bit of the vegetables on your plate. There are little <laughs> kids starving in China right now. Yep. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I still was getting that in the late 70s and early 80s when I was a kid. But it was, you know, America's, you know, Nixon and Kissinger making that deal with Mao and opening up China that helped to save that civilization. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to humanity, frankly. In fact, um, what, yeah, I would. I think it's one of the greatest stories. And I still hear it these days about people who feel, you know, really negative about China and just reminding them that, you know, like, look, the more that we have influenced them, the better they've gotten. The yeah. best thing that's ever happened to China in the last 200 years was... And I, I know a guy who was flying, doing business, flying into Shanghai in the early 90s and really like through the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he said from, like, just say from 1990 to the year 2000, he saw Shanghai go from this small town, not really a village, but a town, to something like the size of Houston. Yeah, it's incredible. And that's the standard of living of the people there going up in just absolutely immeasurable and unimaginable ways in such an incredibly short period of time. Just magnificent. It's not to say that, you know, China's a paragon of virtue or something. Of no, course look, it's not. a one-party dictatorship. Yeah. I mean, no question about it. But the people of China are yep. so much more valuable to consider than just the status of the Communist Party. Yeah, exactly right. And look, back to Taiwan now. America decided, you know, by Jimmy Carter, you know, this was basically continuity between Kissinger and Brzezinski, I guess. But I'm with it in this case. And they, you know, issued the... Shanghai communique. And essentially they said, our policy is that we regard Taiwan to be part of China, one country, and not Taipei, the legitimate rulers of the mainland, as had been the policy since Truman. They were banning that and switching the policy. And they said, but we do not want to see Taiwan and China reunited by force. We would like to see peaceful reunification. Now, this is what's called strategic ambiguity. And you'll see a lot of argument right now about how we need to end ambiguity and we need to demand and say and declare outright that we will defend Taiwan in war if mainland China attacks them. Now, the problem with that is if we end strategic ambiguity and tell Taiwan outright, we will defend you and tell China outright, we will defend them then we are increasing the incentives for Taiwan to declare independence because Bigger Brother has their back. And we're increasing the incentives of China to go ahead and attack them in an overwhelming fashion in order to make any American defense moot. And we are talking about 6,000 miles from our shores here. And we're talking about going up against, if not a first class, at least a second class Navy that does have supersonic sea skimming missiles and, you know, other countermeasures that, according to our Navy and many of the red teams that they've done, they lose in a war with the Chinese Navy over Taiwan. So, in fact, they had a policy called dual deterrence. And the dual deterrence was telling the Chinese from time to time, listen, 
we really want you guys to not attack Taiwan. And we know you're building up quite a force here, but you better not ever use it because we would be really upset. You know what we mean. And then at the same time, but it's still not a promise, but kind of a threat with a wink, you know? And then they would turn to the Taiwanese and they would say, and you pipe down. And don't you get us in a fight with them because we might not come to your defense, especially if you're the one who starts the fight by doing something stupid like declaring independence and then they attack you, we're probably not going to come to your aid if you do something like that. So you back off and you shut up. That was the American policy. Now the American policy seems to be to tell the Taiwanese to mouth off as loud as they can and tell the Chinese, what are you going to do about it? Which is a real change in the state of things and is just a provocation. And, you know, they admit, you know, when they, they talked about how the Navy would sink in a war with China over Taiwan. And then so Michelle Flournoy, who helped lose, who helped escalate and lose the Afghan war famously, yeah. who's from West Exec and one of the co-founders of the Center for a New American Security. Well, she put out a thing saying, oh, well, no problem. We just need to increase our B-1 bombers. And we'll just, you know, increase our air power. She wanted, she said she wants a plan where we can sink the entire Chinese Navy and merchant fleet in 72 hours with air power that they won't be able to deter. But of course, that just means they've got to increase their air defenses and whatever. Like, you know, there's no magic bullet to any of this. And then meanwhile, here's the real important point, Norm, is that let's say that China does invade Taiwan. Let's say they do everything they can. It takes them a few months or however long it is. They wage a massive effort and, you know, let's say the Americans, I don't know, hypothetically, they start to intervene, but then things get hairy and they kind of back off because, you know, they don't want to lose a thousand sailors to the bottom of the sea, that kind of thing. And then China takes Taiwan. Now the question is, now what? Well, first of all, they're going to face the kind of rage of the whole world being against them and sanctions and a break off of trade relations and all kind of consequences and things like that that are good reasons for them to not do it in the first place. But, you know, they'll suffer a pretty major defeat there, economically speaking and politically speaking in the world. And they still would have plenty of power left. So then the question is really that I'm getting at is, does that mean then that Taiwan is first and then next they're going to go to Vietnam, and then to Thailand, and then to Bhutan, and Pakistan, and Kazakhstan, and Outer Mongolia, and Korea, and Japan, and Australia. And then from there, they're going to build their belt and road and conquer all of Central Asia, and then move into Eastern Europe. I mean, all of this is just totally make-believe stuff, right? As I just said, the American government, in writing or at least out loud, certainly in writing for 40 years, but out loud and with handshakes for 50 years, has recognized that Taiwan is part of China. Nobody says that Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and Thailand and I don't know about Outer Mongolia, but, you know, nobody thinks that the Chinese are coming to Japan other than talk radio audiences in America or whatever. But no one who knows <laughs> yeah. anything about that actually in Japan thinks that. Nobody thinks that they're going to conquer the world with violent force. In fact, did you see the remake of Red Dawn a few years ago? No, I haven't seen that one Well, you probably should skip it. But anyway, (laughs) the classic, by the way, if anybody's never seen the 1980s version, it's hilarious and wonderful and perfect. (laughs) But the remake has it where North Korea conquers the world. And that's because, hilariously... It was supposed, or conquers America, well, the world and including America. But the premise originally was going to be China does it. And it was sort of like after the crash of 08, you know, America's on our knees and the Chinese are going to like take stewardship over our society for us. And that's what they call it, right? Lending us a helping hand, taking over our country. But then they got to sell the movie in China. And the Communist Party in China didn't like that. So they had to change it at the last minute to North Korea. Now it makes even less sense. And so the movie begins with like this five-minute montage of news clips where you're supposed to believe that North Korea conquered South Korea and then China and then Japan and all of Southeast (laughs) Asia and whatever. And then they built one million ships and sailed across the entire Pacific and somehow conquered all of North America. And 
the thing of it is, as absolutely just stupidly preposterous as that is, the idea that China would do that is no more realistic in any way. Obviously, they have a hell of a lot more power, military and financial and otherwise, than North Korea. But they're just going to knock over all these dominoes and take over all these countries. And it's going to be all profit and no loss. And everywhere they go, they're just going to steal money and military equipment and collect it and just get more and more and more powerful until someday they sail across the Pacific Ocean and land in California and run us all over (laughs) with their, I guess, Kia trucks that they stole from Korea. Only a talk radio audience could believe that this could be possible (laughs) in a thousand years. It's just not a threat. It's just not. In fact, that's my favorite Abraham Lincoln quote. He says, all the armies of Europe and Asia combined could not make a track on the Blue Ridge or take a drink from the St. Lawrence in a trial of a thousand years. No, if America is to be destroyed, it will be by suicide, he said. And then he's the guy that put the gun to our head and pulled the trigger. But anyway... (laughs) <laughs> he was absolutely right about that. All the armies of Europe and Asia combined, they couldn't conquer the middle part of North America. You have any idea how many rifles we got? That was the famous quote from the general from World War II. The Japanese general was asked, so you guys were preparing to invade and conquer California, is what FDR told us. Is that true? And he said, what? <laughs> I don't know the Japanese word for what? He <laughs> said, there would have been a rifle behind every blade of grass. Yeah. (laughs) And that's just trying to land in Long Beach, right? And never even mind making it a mile inland to, you know, try getting past Crenshaw Boulevard, dude. See how you do there. There's no threat from any foreign state other than if our government gets us in an H-bomb exchange. Yeah. Otherwise, we're completely safe and invulnerable here. That's, I think, the upshot of, you know, kind of all that we're discussing here, right? Is that you know, this kind of unworldly fear of the rest of the world is kind of almost inculcated in us through our own government in a way that like, it's just unfortunate and just immoral in so many ways. And I think just to kind of close out here, there's so much more to be learned about the human race through just paying attention, through foreign travel, through talking to people who are immigrants. And there's so many ways in which the state is just trying to drive wedges between us and the rest of humanity and between yep. us and our neighbors. Yep, and that's And right. that's really, I guess, you know, what we're ultimately fighting against. <laughs> yeah, and look, I mean, the thing is, you live long enough and you shouldn't have to live too long and you have enough examples where, boy, that yep. turned out not to be true. Yep. I mean, anybody can take one of a thousand stories from, or anyone, I should say, of a thousand stories from the COVID hype. Or, you know, look at the way that they pushed Syria during the Obama years. I mean, they're outright backing bin Ladenite suicide bombers who scream, bin Laden, before they set off their suicide bomb. And these are the moderate rebels that America and Israel and Turkey and Saudi and Qatar are backing Mm -hmm. because they're fighting against who? The secular government that's allied with the Shiites. But a president who wears a three-piece suit with a clean-shaven chin. And they say, no, they prefer Osama bin Laden to him. And it's not like it was that clandestine or anything, right? I mean, we all knew it all along. It's all in the book. We all knew it all along. We covered it from the very beginning of the dirty war in the early part of 2011. From the very beginning of the same time they were attacking Libya, they started the dirty war in Syria too. And then they just did it anyway. No one telling the truth about it could stop them. I mean, actually, they almost escalated to real, like, full-scale war in 2013, and the American people did rally together against that and did help stop that. It helped that the British House of Commons had already voted against it, too. But, I mean, the policy, any one of these things, if you look closely at Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, any one of these, Somalia, look at any one of these wars, what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah, pull your hair out. It's completely crazy. None of it is right. None of it's justified. And they lie from morning to night to try to make you believe in it because there's nothing true they could tell you that would make you support it. And so it's just all propaganda, day and night. And look at the whole thing with Russia too. I mean, Condoleezza Rice went on Fox News and she says, you know what? This isn't the Vladimir Putin I know. Well, what does that even mean? 
<laughs> yes, he is Which too. one do you know now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's just a figure of speech because quite yeah. literally, yes, it is the same Vladimir Putin that she knows. So what's her explanation for his behavior? She literally said, well, I think he has a mental illness. <laughs> oh, a mental illness. This isn't just business. This couldn't possibly, Norm, be business. This couldn't possibly be, you know, statecraft. This isn't <laughs> politicians and government officials doing what they think they have to do for reasons. Nope. He's Plum lost his mind. Are you satisfied with that? The only reason anyone would say that to you is because they're lying, because they know it's their fault that they provoked this conflict. And that's why when you turn on TV, you see him say, unprovoked invasion, unprovoked invasion, unprovoked invasion. Well, how come you have to call it that? How come the media, like, where was the email? Did you get the email that said you have to call it that? It wasn't in my email. All government officials in both parties and every media personality of any stature has to call it that. Why is that? It's because the Americans provoked it. Simple as that. Black and white issue. They provoked it, so they tell the lie that it was unprovoked so that you don't wonder what provoked it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and because it's trying to obfuscate that other countries have reasons for doing what they're doing. Even if you don't like it, even if it, like, come on. It, again, you know, as we said earlier, it's kind of baffling to think about just the level of confusion that is being propagated through the American foreign policy state, essentially. Like all the things that are being said at the top are meant to obfuscate just some evident truths if you just start looking in and just a little bit. It's crazy. Yep. But hey, you know, Scott, I mean, we've been going a little long. I know you've got things to do this evening and I've got the natives are going restless above me as well. And as, as probably is getting evident from my from the audio feed. <laughs> but dude, I am so glad we were able to do this. And you know, so if everybody, if you're not familiar, dear listener, with Mr. Scott Horton here, the host of Anti-War Radio for years and a wonderful friend, a wonderful writer, you got to get to know him more at antiwar.com. And of course, where else can people find you at, Scott, as we kind of close out today? Yeah, I'm at antiwar.com. I'm the editorial director there. And I'm at scotthorton.org. That's my uh, radio show. I got 5,700 something interviews going back to 2003 for you there at scotthorton.org. And that's on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and all those kinds of things. And if you go to scotthorton.org slash books or libertarian institute slash books, you can find my books. And that includes Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, The Great Ron Paul, and then the brand new one, which we'll have to talk about next time, is Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And I know that sounds left-wing <laughs> or feminine or something, but it was Ronald Reagan who came one hair away from negotiating an abolition of all of the nuclear weapons off of the face of the earth in 1986. And he would have seen it through with Mikhail Gorbachev and this was when the USSR still stood. It wasn't even falling down yet. The Cold War was ending, but the Soviet Union wasn't falling apart yet at all. And he was still willing to sign this deal. And it was liars who manipulated Ronald Reagan, people in his own administration who manipulated Ronald Reagan in order to prevent him from signing that deal. But it would have been not Michael Dukakis or face-biting rapist Bill Clinton, but Ronald put him on Mount Rushmore Reagan, the greatest patriot of the last 25 years of the 20th century in the United States of America. And he was the one who was willing to do it. He believed he was on a mission from God to do it. And so it's not a left wing and gay and liberal and feminine thing to be against nuclear weapons. It's only rational. And you might argue it's only Christian. But yeah. So I got a whole book. And in fact, the whole book is not about that. That's part of it. But it's actually about all aspects of nuclear weapons on the face of the earth. Every country that has them, their programs and all the politics and how Iran doesn't have them and why it's all W. Bush's fault that North Korea has them and all the rest. So you'll really like it. It's really great. It's called Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. It's a great name for a book. And so I'm going to have to be checking that one out soon, getting that on my, on my bookshelf. But uh, Scott, thanks again for being here. And we just really appreciate it. And dude, I'm looking forward to many more years of working alongside you, you know, in this 
grand fight for freedom. Absolutely. Thank you again, Norm. It's great to be here and great to talk to you again, my friend. All right. So thank you guys for sticking with us for this whole interview. We're so grateful to Scott and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. 